Evening, everybody. Oh, that, that worked well, that. <laughs> I feel like a school teacher. Um, we'll give it a couple of minutes just because we've got a few stragglers who are going to need to walk right down to the front row and sit now. Let's just boo them off when they come in for being late. Um, I just want to cover off a couple of things. There's a toilet right at the bottom of the stairs. This will disappoint most of the crowd, but the bar is shut now until half eight. Um, if you've got your phone, if you could just put it on a silent, that would be perfect. Um, and without much further ado, we've got Graham Armstrong here. A wee round of applause for this man. So we're going to have a chat for the first hour, but Graham is going to do a reading first. So over to you, mate. Thank you. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. I'm going to read instead of the young team for my grand piece, right? It's memoir, so it's, it's everything that I, I read is real. And I'm currently doing it for my thesis at Strathclyde University. The Cloud Factory. There's this wee photograph of at Christmas. My granny's wearing a wee sparkly blue cardigan with her hair all done nice. I'm lying in a chair next to her, wearing white trackies and a black polo shirt with a collar up in a total state. This look could become semi-permanent. I'd stayed out all night with a young Mavis, stood outside the orange hall, drinking butt fast out her nut and ecto pills. My ma was annoyed because she didn't want my granny to know about the violence, the drugs and the madness. I'd already been expelled from the academy and turned up regularly with broken teeth and black eyes. My old gran was not daft. That was one of her last ways. My ma got me a card that said Christmas is a time when you want your past forgotten and your present remembered. I laughed, but I felt bad about it. My loving family were collateral damage to all this. The lurid gangs and territorial violence are unstoppable for many young men in Scotland's former industrial heartland, North Lanarkshire. The hallmarks of modern poverty are all around you. Feed high streets filled with graffiti, shutters and tanning salons and bookies and charity shops and off licenses and old pushy pubs. The prophetic message of Welcome to Hell was spray painted in the way into my high school in Frash Bush, home to the young Crazy Bush. They fight with the Royal Yards ones, the young Bundy, you had us, the young Mavis, the GYT for Green Girls, the Winho Yobos, the Tamil Hill for Gatley, the young Parnell we for, were for Cairn Hill, the Seahall Toy for Chapel Hall, the Plains Toy, the Crooks Dairy, the young Clarkson Dairy, the young Rios for Petersburg, the young Bats for Calder Bank, and the young Mob for Craig Nook. Cope Brig next door was worse, if anything. Down there, you had the RBYT for Red Brig at Coat Brig Sunnyside, the Albion Street Fleeto that took in the big flats at Jackson Court and in Beth, the Young Dykes for Sykeside in Green End, the Cambro Techno next door, the SYT for Shaheed, the famous Lang El Toy and the Young Kirk were all one team for Lang Own, their enemies are for Toonheed, the Paito, the Kirkwood Ra for Kirkwood, the Jetto for Glen Boyg, the young monks for Old Monkland, the young Shaws for Kurt Shaws, and the last before you hurt Glasgow, the Bargy Posse for Bargady. The whole place was mapped out and divided among young teams. I came from a good home, but my father died when I was a wee guy and increased my risk tenfold. There was no immediate reference point about what for me, about what it was to be a Scottish man. Being mental was the chief virtue among these tribes. That became our reality. I was in two gangs, the young Mavis and Airdrie, and the Lang El Toy and Lang Loan, Cope Brig. Violence was par for the course. I was always fighting with cunts and took a few sore ones. There was a pervasive culture of carrying blades. My mum off on a few lockbacks I stashed in my room and flung them on the bin. And we sat with the pals of a young murder victim, and they were all mad, but they still cried for our mate. Haino pulled a machete out on me at the shop and then stole that away right to his nut. And then the lane, a wee jakey walked by the troops and somebody gave him cheek and he whipped a knife out his leather jacket and said, he's enough fucking wide now, are you? Down the park, div for the young dykes, pulled a big kitchen div out and tried to stab our mate. Macintosh for the YM grabbed it off him and flung it down the drain. 
if he had any. Danger Moose was deep, guaranteed. Healthy my year in school, I peered up in a party up our way, and I couldn't stop staring at the slash mark across his face, then his eyebrow, nose, and cheek. Fergus knew her mate got bold and left like a jigsaw. Two lying old toy ones took a knife at my mate's gaff, and were going to stab my tie outside farm foods until he grabbed his sister's baby and held it, and then jumped in a taxi. Me and wee Joe sat in a mad dodgy gaff with a boy who went on to kill. Joe got stabbed three times. He was a lucky boy. A mad cunt was after me, and he said he was going to get me. And without hesitation, I grabbed a long pointy one with a wooden handle out the cutlery drawer and carried that about for a week in my boy and yellow Burgos jacket. He never showed up me end, and I'm glad, because at 14, I was probably the most dangerous I ever was. All that was the external violence. The internal revealed itself in the level of substance abuse, isolation and suicide. Plenty of faces we knew hung themselves, and a good few died because of drugs. We weren't a generation heroin, but it was all around us. I seen boy do overdose and smack and almost die right in front of his nagaf. He was all blue and struggling for every breath. I called an ambulance and his best pal Walker pulled the phone cord out while I spoke to the operator. Life's cheap here. I saved Boydie that day, but they both died no long after. We smoked a powder green and took diazepam and hammered white and pills and guzzled gallons of drink. I sat with boys at Pionder PlayStation weekly for drugs and would sit and smoke solid hash and munch booze all day. They never worked. Our elder ones were heroin addicts and we'd eat about 20 or 30 boy diazepams in one go and then drink warm sugary tea to melt them quicker. They'd pushed the button years back or were coast into towards ruin. Two boys I knew took frightening psychotic episodes. One recovered, one didn't really. My own addiction became so out of control that I barely lived on anything. I would turn up at my ma's door once a week to get bags of messages off her so I would have something to eat. Drink slowly drives you insane and it's ain't in this way. Cunts like us ended up paralytic and black out drunk every time we went on it, in some condition, ranting and raving, no making a bit of fucking sense, fighting or getting lifted off the police. There's no escape. Eventually, one way or another, they all get you. But it falls, is the beginning and the end for me. Thank you. It's hard to read that bit uh, because it's it? a list, you know what I mean? That's right. what, you know, I was, I was faced with a challenge with Grant, all right? It's a, it's a, for those of you who don't know or not familiar, it's a list that comes out once a decade and it's the chosen few, a novelist, and you need to prepare a submission for it. So I spent about three months doing Braveheart. And I was like, they're going to they're love this, right? It's a bit different. So I spent three months and then they rejected it. <laughs> so I had a month to, to turn this into something. So I was like, I've got 1,500 words. How do I condense a decade of Scottish gang culture into mm. that? So that's what I came up with. Just a list. It's just one after another. It's, it's really hard to read. It's exhausting. It must have took you back, though. It did. It's, it's just like that layer. It's, I heard that phrase, the death by a thousand cuts. There's your thousand cuts. Mm -hmm. It's just like one after another, you know. When you get punched in the face, it's like getting punched in the face every time you've been punched in the mm -hmm. face. So when you get punched, you get punched 20 times. You know, when somebody dies, the 20 people have died or die again. That's how trauma works. Yeah. It's like a snowball, you know. So that was what it was. And then it goes into the, the sequence of events, which were the end for me. You know, my friend came out in a murder, me getting stabbed, and then finding faith. And that was, that's why I'm still here, guys. Aye, man. Mate, that's it's unbelievable. It's a tough piece for my yeah. family, you know what I mean? So It is, but you've also got to look at it of where you are just now. and Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're a bit massively successful on the back of it as well. Um, and it probably ties into the, the first thing that I want to talk about, which was the young team. You've obviously read that part there that was your life. At what point did you feel you were strong enough to be like, I'm going to write a book? Not based on your life, but there is elements of it that are... Oh, I don't know. I don't know if strength come in here, mate, to be honest. Yeah. I think it was an act of desperation in the end. Yeah. You know, um, you know I, I found myself at 18 year old, right? I was a, I was a fantastic Ned. I was a really successful Ned. <laughs> Honestly, I was brilliant. <laughs> Right, I looked at a ticket, you've probably seen the, the pictures on Instagram, 
they look like staged now, do you know what I mean? When I look back, I look at but you know, I was great in that that theatre operations, but I you know what I was really shite at uni. Right. You know, I didn't look right, I didn't t- I sound right, I was dead nervous. You know, I went to stay in halls and my family have got this expectation of like, oh that's it, man, problem solved at uni. It's yeah. done amazing. You know what I mean? And I'm sitting in my halls that first night with my two gold two P rings looking like <laughs> fucking Jack Sparrow or something. Do you know what I mean? Like totally incongruent to a, a very middle class environment, yeah. you know? And uh, I was nervous, man. Honestly, I was like, I don't know what to say to these people. I've got nothing to relate to. Mm-hmm. So I kind of shuffled out and I was I was sanitizing the way I spoke. I, Hi, nice to meet you, I'm Graham. <laughs> you know, just subtly, you know what I mean? But, yeah. <laughs> so I, you know what I mean? Very different. You know, yeah. experience, um, and it just, things got worse for then on, man. Mm-hmm. You know, I got to the stage where I was very, very, like, isolated, struggling with drug addiction, taking Valium tablets every day, yeah. staying up all night, you know, very isolated for the uni experience. And then right at the end of that, you know, I stopped taking drugs. It's like a, the light bulb moment, mm-hmm. you know, and then I start writing, and it just flows at me, man. That's what it was. It was just like an outpouring. What was the, what was the kind of pivotal moment for stopping? With drugs. For the badness? Yeah. Oh, I had tried numerous times. You know, I had two pals and I would say our addictions were on a par, right? We would all take Valium, right? And you know, the Scottish drug death epidemic is fed by Valium tablets, right? It's not just all heroin users and serious drug use. All drug use is serious. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'd, like that, one is would stop, right? And the other two would find that inspirational, right? And then they would stop or they would try. And by the time they were two or three months, you'd be back. You know, you'd be back using drugs every day. Mm. And it, it was, your family could see it, do you know what I mean, mate? It was like, because if somebody's taking drugs every day, right, and they're spewing off you, and they're just skulking about the way people that use drugs day, that, it's a full-time job, right? And then they're bright-eyed, they're walking, they're confident. You know, their hope goes up and down me every mm-hmm. time. You know what I mean? Right. So after my pal had killed somebody in the, the early year, in 2012, and after I get stabbed, Right, it was a big wake-up call for me. Like, I can't do this anymore. I can't go down sitting gaffs. Right, I was lucky that time. So I isolated myself completely for the world. No boy as that was, it was a time bomb. That's what it was. You know, I'm sitting using dr- the only place I would go, right, apart from doing the very like minimal, like turn up to the odd tutorial, you know, to get put out uni. Aye. Right, all I would do was sit in a wee gaff until I could try. I would smoke my pan in my green and I would take Valium. And then at the end of all that, right, I just, I was losing it. I was losing mm-hmm. it, you know what I mean? And Christmas Eve came, and I don't know why Christmas, well, it makes you depressed, doesn't it? It can be a, a nice time, but it can be the can worst be, of times right. as well. If things are going wrong, you know, it just weighs on you. And at that day, I don't know why particularly, but it just, I, it was just bad, mate. It was really yeah. bad. Rock bottom, you know? And um, the day wore on, right? And this old woman, I heard a chap at the door, but I stayed until I got to and I didn't know anybody up there, right? I heard a chap at the door. So I got up, and it was, it was nobody there, but it was a Christmas card for this wee old woman. And uh, I opened it, and it said, Love Betty, number 17, right? And I was, I was moved, right? That was, that was how desperate I was, right? I was looking for something. I was looking for love. I was looking for connection, right? So I, was, I went away, right? I stole it into the night, and I was going to get a Christmas card, and I was going to write it, and I was going to put it through Betty's door, right? And I was away around, man, right? All the shops are shut, right? It's like 8 o'clock on Christmas Eve, right? Everyone's shut. Right, and I went away around Sterling Mills, and I was standing in the middle of a shopping centre myself, right, in the dark, right, and I was just pure lost. I was, I was lost, so I was, I was a lost soul. And I went back, and honestly, I just broke down. I was greeting my night, I was just in bits. And I just, honestly, I just clamped my hands together, like and I just prayed, honestly, and I was like, all right, big chat, I need help, badly. Right, I'm in bad, bad trouble, right. Oh, no, right, the angels didn't appear, the Christmas star didn't, you know what I mean? It's not like that, it's not a dialogue, it's a one, it's a one way call, right? But you know what, I felt something, and I can't tell you what I felt, I just felt something. I didn't feel as alone as I did, I didn't feel as desperate as I did. So I just got up, off my knees, right, wiped my tears, and I went away down. And I, the only place I was welcome, right, because I was, I was quite estranged at the time, right? Mm-hmm. I was always welcome, my mother's house, but Aye. I was a thieving drug addict, right? So I went away down, I was sitting with the troops, right, and they're just staying with the day, they were drinking wine, they were smoking, right, and I'm like, I'm done, man, I've had enough, right, and I just stood up, they don't know this revelation has happened, right, they, I mean, they're just one of the troops, and I'm like, I'm Oski, right, and I went up, chat my mum's door, right, and chance had that she was already walking up to the church, right, 
So she, I says, I'm going to come to church with you, is that all right? And she says, aye, aye, that's fine, right? So she's all dressed up in a nice coat and all that, right? A church goer, you know what I mean? And uh, so I went, right, and I'm in, I'm in church and it's all the old deals and, oh, Merry Christmas on my wee man's pie. I'm like, oh, nice, thanks. I'm sitting pure, <laughs> it's sort of, you know what I mean? Right, and you know what, I walked out, right, Christmas morning, 2012, and I looked at my ma and I went, I'm had enough, I'm done. She didn't believe me. She, I was going to say, it, She heard it all before, right? Heard every time I went on that journey with her, man, right, and I says, I'm off it, right, I'm going to change. I, she would she would put her hope in you, and then you would hurt her again. So people are in, inevitably become less vulnerable to that, mm-hmm. you know, over time. So, but this time was different, mate. I, I never used drugs again. You know, I did. And it was, uh, I'm not saying it was just that easy, right. you know, but it was just, that was the anchor that kept me, kept me going, man, you know. It's a lot of wee twists of fate. It is, mate, right. it is. What if that woman didn't put the card through? You know, would I just lost my mind? Would I just kept going and just the misery? Would I just continued until you just burst? So that's what happens. That's the bravado of the young team. And, you know, I think the young team's honest in that way, right? But real life is different. It's no fiction, right? The cavalry don't always ride in and save the day, you know what I mean? Your best pal doesn't always take you to the airport and wish you well. You're on your own. You need to rebuild your life, you know, and you're not made to feel welcome in lots mm. of places. And I wasn't, I was on my own. I was, yeah. I was very lonely. You know, tell me, that, tell me that you went back and spoke to me, Betty. <clears throat> I never seen her again, oh, mate. You know, I just, no, I never, I never did. And, she, you know, and, and the impact that she's made on your life for that card. I know. Don't even know if she's still about mate. Probably not. You know, it was a long time ago. But listen, honestly, that wee one gesture of kindness mm-hmm. saved my life. Just changed me, mate. You know, right. I think to be honest, what it was, right, is it just reminded me of all the love I'd had when I was a kid, right? And I was, I had a loving family down there waiting for me. Mm-hmm. But that's not enough. You need to walk through the door. Yeah. You know, and I wasn't, I was, I was lost, man. Did you, you'd said obviously your mum had seen this before and she'd seen you try different times. Mm-hmm. Was there a point at this time where your mum it kind of said something to your thought, right, this is, no, mate, this is it this time. To be honest with you, mate, you know, a couple of journalists, like, did your family know? <laughs> did my mum know? Fuck's sake. <laughs> 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 no. I, I think she knew when I got expelled from school, and I think she knew when she was taking all these knives off me, she knew, and, you know, you're coming in covered in blood, and, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're just, she sees a yeah. kid that she raised alone. My dad died when I was a young kid, and she never remarried, so she was a, I was a single-parent family, you know? And she'd seen me go for like a nice, quiet young boy that was just, I don't know, just quiet and, mm-hmm. you know, loving. And he uh, just a fucking monster, you know, and just somebody that didn't care about herself and had genuinely gave up on life. That's what I was. And it starts all the bravado and the bullshit and all the pals and all that, but it just, for me, it went really, really deep down into this misery, you know. How also, did your pals react? Like, to coming off it. Aye, like, and, and staying. I don't know, man. It's a weird one because at the time, I think people, you become a mirror for people and you feel very judged by you, man. I think that still happens. Mm. You know what I mean? People still don't really understand your choices. They don't, you know, loads of my pals work in the trades, right? And so they, as soon as they finish, right, they're in for a pint, right? And then, do you know what I mean? It's just that rhythm of life is different, right? And, you know, when I said I was got uni, right, they were like, oh, uni and all that. But most of them just kind of realised you were a wee bit different. Mm. Yeah, you were just different. You know what I mean? And it was accepted. You know? And I take it you, obviously you might not speak to a lot of them now or you might not be in contact with people now, but when you do, that must kind of hit you as well because your life's totally I'm still in, I'm still in contact with them all, mate. Aye. Let me tell you, you know, my mum got a bit, she was, well, I say a bit sick, she was very sick last mm-hmm. year. It was touch and go for a while. And you know one of the only pals that phoned me? The one that had the SIM card up his arse in jail. <laughs> Right, that tells you about the quality, no, but it tells you about the yeah. quality of friendships, right? I would have rode into battle for some of these boys and died for them, right? And went to jail for them and, you know what I mean? Yeah. They don't bother. Because they've got their own lives now, but, you know, some of them, you know, my pal phoned me all the time. I was sending them stuff into jail and all that. Mm-hmm. Like CDs, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Fucking, just, I'm still there. I'm still one of them. Yeah. Just, there's a level of removal now. A lot of them are parents. You know, they've got young families and they're, they're either away and they're changed, right, and they're quiet now, or they're mad and they're still away, mm-hmm. you know. I've got, to, um, I've got to ask you about Mr. MacGyver. Hi. That it probably, it, in a way, it's a bit like Betty, because you're in high school, mm. you're failing exams, you've been kicked out of school, you're away to another school, 
busy enough for teachers just to be like, he's not going to go anywhere. But mm. one one guy he could see took the opposite man. approach. He was a superstar and he had a superpower at seeing hidden potential. That was what it was. And I don't know how he saw it, but he just not, they just saw it, you know. Mm-hmm. I walked into his office and he'd already met my mom, right? So he obviously sees here's a, you know, respectable woman on her own, doing her best, right? So that's built value, you know, and then and then I walk in, fucking John Wayne or something with my Mera Pecan, with my, do you know, the attitude, <laughs> right? I remember sitting and like that, you know, you don't sit in a chair, you sit in a chair like that, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And he just laughed. He just laughed because he's seen it a million times. I thought I was an expert. He was an expert in gang culture. You know what I mean? And I, fuck, I've told that story a million times. Yeah, I love it. What? I you love know, it. He, he just said, you know what I mean? Aye, all right, Mr. Armstrong. You know what I mean? And he said, let me tell you, if you think you, uh, Airdrie was bad, you wrote the frying pan in the fire. Right? I had no clue. I didn't know anybody in Coatbridge, right? I genuinely, I just, I had no clue what I was going to do. Right, and honestly, by an interval that day, well, even before that, right, the boy, <laughs> my first class, right, when I date with day one, right, he's like, somebody needs to show Graham his next class and get away five minutes early, right, everybody puts their hands up, right, he chooses the biggest wide on the full <laughs> class, right, a boy called Paddy for Sykes East, right, he's built that brick shit house, right, a big unit, a guy, and we're walking down the corridor, right, and I'm like, fuck, what is this place, man, right, and literally, one of the Lang the top boy for Lang walks by, the two of them start boxing, right, they're fighting in the <laughs> corridor, I'm standing my first day like that, what's going on, man, and I, know what I mean, and he's all, he's all dishevelled now, he's like, fuck, you fucking dirty, I'll fucking get him, and I was like, who's that, and he's like, I was Murphy for Lang I was like, right, fuck, I've heard them, right, so, and that was it, man, so I went and introduced myself, <laughs> and became a Lang one, you know what I mean, so. What an introduction for you got your next class, you've joined a gang. Nah, honestly, <laughs> aye, it, took, aye, it took me one period to join a gang, basically. Yeah, do you know, when I was sitting, and I would, obviously we'd, we've done a podcast before, the the impact that Mr MacGyver had on you around about your exams and going back and doing them, mm. that's one of the best things I've ever heard. I just, do you know what, like, unfortunately for me, I was, I was trying, right, I was, I was studying, right, I had just... Honestly, once I read Train Spotting in school, right, again, right, it was came out of tragedy, right? As I said at the beginning, right, I was there when a boy overdosed on heroin, right, and I saved his life. And within that year, the boy who I saved ran away and left the other one and he died, right? And I had seen that, right? I mean, seeing death is different from hearing about it or reading about it. You know, you hear people talk, professionals talk about it in a map, but have you seen it? Have you seen somebody with their life slipping away and people just stand fucking doing nothing? I can't bear that. It drove me nuts. There's a fly to hijack me. <laughs> <laughs> right? But honestly, right, it's not like you've seen train spot and he's not just this clean hang man. It was like, you know, the signs of a life struggling to kick start, you know what I mean? Grunting and all that. It was, it was horrible, man. Right? And just blew, right? Horrendous for, hang, for a 16 year old to see that. It was tough, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And I know some people have that, and that's like everyday life, but honestly, I had never seen that, and it was shocking to me. And there I was in school, right, you know, dafty, in fifth year, disregarded, disrespected, right, waste of space, why is he back, right? And then the girl sitting next to me says, why don't you do train spotting? Why, that's, you know, for your personal study, that's a book you can read and write about, right? And there I'm all right, and, and I did, <laughs> one of my female friends bought me this book, right, you know, and I did what all young people do when you give them a book. I stuck it in my school bag and I didn't look at it, right? But after that, right, after all that chaos and all that, I just, I picked it up because I was looking to escape, right? I was trying to get out my own head, right? So I, and I had read when I was a kid, there was books in my home, right? So I start reading this and there it is, it's like, you know what I mean? It's the train spotting story, it's, it's heroin and violence and Scots and it just, all right, it's, you know, 35 miles down the wrong side of the M8, right? But it was our life in some ways, you know? So it was powerful. So I was like, I can do this, right? I can read books, right? That's like a revelation for somebody like me, mm-hmm. right? It made me feel like I mattered in some small way. And beyond that, you know, I used to go about saying, oh, I don't care, I don't give a fuck. You know, that's like the hard shell I put on to survive, right? But actually underneath, I did care. You know, and that book reminded me that I cared. So, aye, that's when I went. I went for a huge jump. It was like a great leap for just reading a book to saying, I'm going to go uni and study English. Because it was all I had. So I just, I held on to it. And then obviously, fucking 15th for me, 2008, is the day after the 14th for me. 14th for me, Rangers, UEFA Cup final, was in St. Petersburg. 
So I went out fucking all weekend, you know, steaming, you know what I mean? And I went into the exam and I was nervous, but I had studied, but I made a complete arse out. Right, I did, I failed, I got an F. And, uh, and all the teachers that were saying I was a waste of space, right? I had proved them all right, because here I was, I'd failed, I'd used a, a seat, you know, I'd wasted my opportunity. Um, but I just, I came back, man, I licked my wounds, you know, and I was like, I'm going again, I'm going to, I'm going to do it again, I'm going to reset. But resets are kind of, I don't know if there's any teachers in the house, but, you know, resets are putting a certain, you know, demograph, right? They're kept away for the good teachers and where they're going to get high pass grades, they were putting the dumping ground. So I got the kind of eccentric teacher, right? It was like ancient, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, you know what? Eccentric and ancient though she might have been, she had very good taste. She did the great Gatsby and Crucible. And that was two texts that just blew me away. Because mm -hmm. there I was, right? I mean, Ned, Fairdry. And I'm reading about Gatsby and all that, right in the twenties. And I was like, I can read anything now, right? And I got it, I really did get it. You know, I understood it was another level of textual analysis that goes beneath, right? It's not, it's about the American dream, it's about class struggle, right? It's about no fitting in and no belonging, you know? It's not about witches, it's about communism, you know what I mean? It seems like very podding, but that yeah. is how you teach somebody, yeah. you know, to look beneath. It's a skill, man. I'll sit with my wall sometimes and watch a film, right? And I'll start talking about it, I'll start deconstructing, because that's what I've been trained to do as a professional, like take things to bits. She's like, can you never just watch a film? <laughs> and I'm like, honestly, I can't, eh? because <laughs> that's right, it's a skill. <laughs> you, know I mean? you don't take things at face value, yeah. you take them apart, you know? So, aye, man. So that was how, that's what it started, you know what I mean? And I, honestly, but, but I see by then, I knew what I was doing, honestly. I was on the road to success. And I remember one of the teachers, right, and I always tell that story, right, see, when I failed, she really didn't like me, right, she didn't like me. And the teachers are human, they're allowed not to like kids sometimes, even, they don't say it, right. She caught my eye, right, when she knew, it, when she'd found that I failed and she winked, right, and just to say, I told you so, right. So I, I was on a vendetta against this woman, <laughs> to prove her wrong, but just to show that I mattered, right. Mm -hmm. And you know what, I done it, man, I got an A, I turned an F into an A. And a B and a C, and the story you're talking about, that's what you want to say, yeah. isn't it? I see you nodding there. Do you know about, Do you know why though? Because it's probably relevant to so many kids that are doing exams no. right now. No, I know. That, that are in the same position. I know. So I, man, all these teachers that didn't like me and wanted me tossed out and all that. Right? Obviously, teachers have a meeting the day before the exam results because they get them early. So Mr. Rawlinson, the Neil MacGyver, waited until they were all in and he slammed my results down, right? And he said, Graham Armstrong. A for higher English, got university. There's a boy you threw away. Silence. Love that. Pure power. Right? And mm -hmm. I only found that out, right? Because I went to, I went back up to the school after he thanked my teachers. It's geeky, you know. <laughs> I, I wanted to just say thanks, especially to my English teacher, Miss Robertson. It really looked after me, right? And uh, it was one of the heads. She was a bit of a critic of mine, right? But she, she came over and she was like, well done. And then it was her that told me that story, so it was. So I, I he never knew I would find mm -hmm. that out. So. And then it's a circle as well, because he came to your first book signing. Nah, and he did, man. Aye. He was there at Sucky Hall Street, man. That's He's unbelievable. An older man, you know what I mean? With a walking stick and all that, but still six foot four and still. I actually interviewed him this year, so I did. Um, and spoke to him about that very moment. But he takes, he takes no credit, honestly. It's frustrating, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you're, you're, you're trying to tell somebody what a pivotal role they had in your life, genuinely, and he just says, nah, it was all you, it wasn't me. It just deflects it. Yeah. This is heroic. Do you, obviously you do a lot of work now in schools and in prisons, do you go in there sometimes and see kind of you? Gary, as I, spent 13, more I spend more time in school than I did when I was at fucking school. <laughs> I've, I've done more than I've done more than twenty <laughs> schools this year, so I have I can't get them, man. Because see, last November I got the amazing opportunity to speak at the School Leaders Scotland conference. That's uh, a big fancy conference in the old course hotel with three hundred head teachers. Um, so I, I did a, a keynote and I spoke for an hour with them, and it was after dinner, so they've had a few a few champagnes, right? And they're uh, well on, and they did warn me this is going to be a tough gig, by the way, to keep attention, you know. Um, but honestly, there was, as always, when you speak to staff, there was tears, there was laughs, and I, I said, they've all been asked me to go and work. <laughs> so I've been doing it as much as I can. 
How do you find it? Because you must oh. you must see wee Grahams at 12, 13, 14 and... Aye, mate, it makes you feel old, that's for sure. <laughs> God, I still feel... I'm, I'm young in the kind of literary fiction world, but you're very old at 32 going into yeah. school. You know, and um, my first ones, I made a complete arse. It's a learning curve. You know, it's, a, it's trial by fire. You know, there's not a manual to say this is how you need to go in and engage children. Because I kind of, you know, I assumed it would be a uni lecture, a uni tutorial or something, and everybody was going to be having a rich debate. And they just start looking at you like, what the fuck? Is this okay? <laughs> What's he talking about? Right, so I learned quick. And the first time I spoke in a school was teachers, staff only. And honestly, they were really, really disengaged. They looked really bored. They'd pulled them up on their lunch break and they were all just like, what the fuck is this guy? I'm bored. And it was, I just didn't do a good job. Do you know what I mean? I hadn't prepared properly. Mm. I didn't know. Right, so see when I started doing this round, when I was doing staff talks and pupils, I was prepared to the nth degree. Yeah. Right, my girlfriend sitting in the back and she helped me prepare like with <laughs> PowerPoint and all that, right? So I, I was going in fully armed this time to captivate genuinely and, and catch on, you know, their interest and I did that, you know? And it just, but honestly I was dreading it and she, she's probably laughing because <laughs> there's sometimes at night I'm like, I can't do this, but anyway, I'm, I'm just falling apart. And I was like, I just need to do it, man. Honestly, it's right where I belong, so. Can you, or did you spot the signs of any kind of young guys that were you oh, at that age? Take a pick, man. <laughs> they bring them in, they only they choose the bad ones. <laughs> right, my old school, right, they had, they had um, 15 boys, right, they had cherry picked. The, the, the most at risk or involved, mm -hmm. nine of them were suspended. Right, so I only spoke to six of them. Right, and that was the one I was telling you at the beginning, when he was, he said, so, can I drink this can of brew? And, I'm, and we were in the library, so I was like, aye, on you go. And then our deputy walked in, he's like, hey, why are you drinking a can of brew? <laughs> and he looked at me as if I'd betrayed <laughs> <laughs> Set him up or something. And I was like, that was my fault, I take full responsibility, <laughs> right, for the iron brew. But do you know what? Like, I really, that was, I think that was the first great one. Mm -hmm. you know that? I really, really caught him, man. And you could see, you can tell, Young guys, see when you really engage them, right? And I mean, when you're speaking to them at their level, they don't want to hear it. They want to push back. They always come in uncomfortable sometimes. And that's when you know, mm -hmm. like, they are doing this stuff, right? They're out there involved in violence, right? And I'm talking about people getting murdered. And they know that there's weapons in their town. We know what's happening, guys, right? I don't want to be alarmist. I don't want to be, you know, feed into negative media tabloid stuff, right? But gangs are coming back. There is a problem in Scotland, right? We're in denial at the minute. We're still coasting this fan, you know, fantasy that violence is solved. It was a 2005 problem, right? It peaks in troughs, it lulls, and then it comes back. We're in the upward ascendancy now, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and all the evidence suggests that. Helped along by COVID, helped along by cost of living, right? Helped along by cultural influences for our places. You know, I seen a young team there, night. So I did. I I I've seen a young a full team. Young team. No, it's a full young team. I've got, I've got a witness, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? They had Fitba track, they had actual Fitba trackies on, right? I thought I was like, I'd went back in time or so, right? But honestly, and then they went driving through Sykes Side and there's a big SSYT, fuck the bush, right? And there it's there, there's a the proof. Mm. She's going to document that, right? <laughs> but see, when I started noticing, right? And I say, I take credit for noticing, right? But teachers were telling me, right? Teachers yeah. are the experts, ignore them at your peril, because they deal with that shit every day. Right, they know how many people are out in suspension. Right, they know what weapons are getting found in the school, and they can roughly hear or see the social media stuff. They've been saying it for two or three years. It's coming back. Street fashion, violence, gang culture, this disengagement, yeah. right, and then COVID. Right, so everything's like, everything's shit. But that's back. You think more can be done as a preventative? I think you need to. We need to try, man. Mm. You know, that's what, that's what this is all about. You know, my working skills is, is cautionary tale, you know, yeah. telling, you know, I can't be with them on a Friday night when they're out with their pals, right? I can't compete with the teenage bravado and the forces that are under, right? I know how big they are because that's why I've got a book to write. That's why I've got this material because I, you know, I couldn't, I succumb to all that myself. I'm not an expert in youth culture. I was when I was 15, I was there, you know, but people are like, oh, there's no data. Oh, you know what? Ten years ago, there was no data for county lines. Now there's PhDs, PhDs books, libraries full of books about county lines. They, you know, these phenomena come. Mm -hmm. You know, the data is always after the event. Yeah. Like Karen McCluskey very rightly said, um, 
absence of evidence as the evidence of absence. Yeah. Know what I mean? But even as, as you said as well, if you're in schools, if you're making, if one kid listens to you and goes away and goes, you know what, I'm going to try and saw my life out a wee bit more, then it's, it's like, working. You're try, you know, it's not just doom and gloom and guts and yeah. all that, right? You're in there trying to show that, you know what, I'm actually a professional now, like I've got a job, I'm a, you know, I'm a doctoral researcher, which, you know, mm. they can do something with their life that's better than just nothing, you know what I yeah. mean? At the sharp end of that, you're trying to encourage them not to put a Valium tablet in their mouth, it's going to kill them, or not to put a, a knife in their pocket, it's going to kill somebody else. As simple as that. Mm -hmm. I've got to ask, what, what crowd were you worried about more, a school crowd or a prison crowd? <laughs> oh God, that's an easy one, man. Everybody's terrified to get into prison. Right? Prison is a, it's not a nice place. It's not meant to be. It's a pure of experience, isn't it? You know, so my first experience with prison, right, was shots with Natalie Logan, you know, the drugs campaigner, Hedy Sisko, she's fantastic, uh, toured the force, a human being, um, and uh, she invited me into the recovery cafe, so that's where it's in a normal, a softer setting, like the chaplain say, and it's guys that are struggling with substance abuse, they'll come in and they'll share, and it's, it's like a circle meeting, you know what I mean? And uh, they have cups of tea and all that, it's not what you expect, you know, they have cups of tea, they say how you getting on, you know, drugs are really readily available in prison, right? Because they fetch a high price. They, they take a lot of legal highs and drugs that are not traditionally as detectable. You can't send a book into prison, right? Because they were dumping the books in the legal, as they call it, right? And then smoking the pages, you know? So they're very, very strict about that now, which is it's difficult to be in prison, you know? Um, but I see, see we're in the first, so I, I was in this circle meeting, right, in HMP shots, there's a max security, right, everybody is doing a lifer, right, so it's serious drugs offences, homicide offences, armed robbery, all the, all the bad stuff, right, and I'm walking in, right, I'm terrified, right, I was not, I was really quite anxious at the time as well, in my own mental health, and I'm like, if somebody's, uh, doesn't like being locked in anywhere, a prison is not a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, I, I survived it, honestly, and the book was only at a proof stage, and I read for them about addiction, and really, honestly, I got a good reaction off them, they really mm -hmm. did, um, and they were very, very generous to me, you know that? It wasn't really what you expect at all. Yeah. I had said to my mate, oh fuck, they can't run away, it's a captive audience, right, and he laughed, he was face shot, <laughs> right, and you know what, I felt really bad about saying that after yeah. that, because, you know, I was making light of it, right, but actually they're not, they're not a captive audience, everyone at the recovery cafe or in education has chosen to be there. Right, they've made a conscious decision, notice that in their Peter, which is the gap, you know, the gaff, and they've, they've come into a vulnerable space, right, and they're a lot more traumatised and damaged and numb, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So honestly, it was a, a tough experience, but one I would highly recommend to all yeah. professionals, if you can ever get behind the door, to go and sit with them, they're an incredibly grateful group of people, mm -hmm. regardless of what they've done, they've been punished, but they did, I don't ask their offence. Right, I only work with mainstream, I don't work with so sexual offenders, right? I did get asked and I said no because it's just, it's no my remit, right? I'm talking to people that come from schemes, right, that have been involved in drugs and violence because that's what my experience is, right? I, so I've done, I did loads in Berlin, right? I only was in shots a couple of times, but mostly in Berlin and then Pullman. Pullman was tough. That one was, a, yeah. that one was a punch right in the stomach, so it was. Why? Because a lot of the young men there were on remand for murder. <laughs> And they're only young teenagers, mm. you know, and it just is spiritually draining, you know, because, you know, it's just shit. <laughs> you know, yeah. a lot of these kids have been in the care system. They're just the true, the true people who have failed as a society, you know. And there was young, one young man in there that I had sent a book to when he was in a security unit. And it was, it was a hang at the time, right? It ended up the media got a hold of it and it became a story. I ah, was in there, so I ah, just, it was a bit draining, you know that. But and the thing is, as well, though, is, you know, that could have been you. Oh, oh, mate, you know, I don't even think of that in that way, you know mm -hmm. that? I don't think I would end up in prison, I think I would end up in the cemetery. Really? Aye, because you know what, by the time, you know what, by the time I had read train spotting, right, I was never really aggressively violent again because I had that nothing to lose that feels violent, and I think that is why people are truly get violent, right, because they've got nothing to lose, they just don't care. Right? There's no consequences to life. It's like, do you know what? Fuck it. Fuck it. You know what I mean? You, you need to ask, right? Why are jails not fully middle class privileged people? Because I've got too much to offer. You're going to smash somebody or stab somebody. Aye, mate. It's, um, 
I have not been in for a while because it's been school, school, school. Yeah, yeah. Know what I mean, and that's see in prison, no phones, no computers, no fancy powerpoints. It's literally you, that's a paper and talk. So it's tough that way. But school, you can do the whole shit and much. Mm -hmm. You can get the videos. You know, and kids are visual learners, I find a lot of the time. See if you try and talk at kids for an hour. Or, but see if you show them videos, I'm like, yeah, so much no video in school, you <laughs> know what I mean? <laughs> and I just saw I, I <laughs> break my talk up. Aye. My frequent videos and things to look at and different kinds of stimulus, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Stories and pictures and pictures. All these pictures, man, that I've got, right? And there's only maybe, I don't know, 50 or something, but they really are hard to argue with, yeah. aren't they? They're hard to argue with. You know, you saw kids and they're like, wow, they're actually amazed. Because I look, I look, I'm the same person, but actually I look completely different in my pictures. Yeah, yeah. You know? Rather than you just, he's talking the top, but he's actually done I can't it. Do you know, I can't mind to say that, right? And I, I say it all the time, and all right, but somebody call, they called me Benjamin Button. Because <laughs> 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 they're like, you've no change for, for high school, mate. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? It's 15 years ago. And he's like, ah, you just, you just look exactly the same. But what I think he actually means is I look better at 32 than I did when I was 15. <laughs> and I mean that seriously. You know, by the time I was 18, that picture with the scabs on my face and all that, I mean, that was a real doozy. Mm -hmm. I only found that at Christmas, so I did. I, I opened my cupboard in my mom's bit, man, and it just came floating right down into my hand. So it did. What are Christmas things happening here? I don't know, mate. You know the story? Uh -huh. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Right? It just floated down in my hand and I was looking at it and I was like, Jesus Christ, man, I'd never seen it. I'd never seen that picture and I don't know why my ma did that, right? But every time I was in a state like that on Christmas, she took a picture of me, right? Just one. And now it's become an evidential basis, yeah. you know? It's just show. I mean, that's what the whole cloud factory is about. It's about a picture of me when I was 15 and I really was upside down. And it's like, uh, I'm just lying completely fucked. And there's my granny with her wee sparkly boys and her wee hat on, do you know what I mean? It's just like, it's like love and just pure heart, you know what I mean? Yeah. Even at that age, it's yeah. just this gulf between these. And then the 40s later, she's gone. She's not in the 40s anymore. Mm. But then I, that one, when I was 18 or 19, I was just completely, I looked seriously, I looked the same as all the heroin addicts. I sat with man, I had scabs all over my face and all that. And just for just pure abuse to my body, man. I wouldn't eat for days. All I would take was drugs. Honestly, I was I was hanging by a thread. I know staff in school were worried about me at mm. times. They were like, we really are quite concerned about you. What was your viewpoint at that point? Fuck Just, it. Aye. Fuck it, who gives a fuck? Aye. I remember one day when I was up in court and I took like a wee suit I had for a funeral or something and I'd put it in my school bag and fucking I'd went into the toilets to get changed, right? Because I, I hadn't told my mom I was up. I don't even think she still knows, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was getting to jail or anything like that, by the way, so I, I was all right, right? So we'd saved a hundred pound, it was stuff like vandalism and theft or something, right? It was something stupid, right? Broke into motors, right? Teenage stupidity, right? But we'd saved a hundred pound up and that was no wean feet, right? So I went in and I'm, I get changed, right? And one of my yearheads caught me walking out with a suit on. She's like, you're looking very smart today, right? You've got, it's the first time I've ever seen a tie in your neck, <laughs> right? And I'm like, I've got a job interview. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think I said I've got a college interview, mass. And funnily, she became one of the heads at a behaviour school in Falkirk, and I just went to work at her school, so I did. So it was a real return seeing that, you know. <laughs> but uh, aye, man, you know, getting caught and all that, criminal justice. Nuts, mate. Crazy. I've got to ask as well, and I've asked you about ten times about this. So the, there is potential for the young team to be a TV show at some point. A screenwriter sitting in the back, Ben, there you go, um, and we're working on it, we're just, it's such a long process, Yeah. you know, see, writing's a very solitary sport, you know, you do it, you're the, the master it, you decide, and then the editing process is usually fairly light, you know, if it needs major surgery, it's unlikely to be published, you know, it's, it's fine tuning when you get to that stage, but TV's like a team sport, you know, you've got, You've got to convince, you know, what the company to make it and buy it. Right. And then you've got to convince commissioners and it's like notes galore, man. So I we've been taking notes for two and a half, three years now. So we have. But notes are better than no notes. Aye. You know? So I, I'm hopeful. And um, not just because I make make a quid or two, but just <laughs> <laughs> and actually uh, be able to live. But the fact that a lot of these young people, right, no matter how well you write, they'll just never ever read a book. So yeah. you'll engage a completely new audience of people, right, including people that sit in jail. Quite a lot of the boys in jail said they had watched Scotland the Rave in jail. Yeah. Know what I mean? So 
they see it. <laughs> no, well, they're behind the door. So just, just everybody watches telly, yeah. didn't they? No, everybody reads books. So no matter how good a writer you are, your message or your, your purpose will not always reach. So, I am hoping, I'm hoping, we're hopeful. Seamlessly linked into Scotland, the how did it come about? Was it was it your <laughs> idea or had somebody approached you it about a, it? It was a bit of both, mate, right. to be honest. Scott and the Rave was, um, I did the Damien Bard book show, the big Scottish book club. Mm-hmm. And uh, honestly, I was terrified that night. I was just right at the beginning, honestly. And uh, pre-pandemic and all that, really nervous. But I did a really good interview because he's such a nice guy. He's just up the road, he's finished Hill. So our lives are very similar in that way. Um, you know, Damien's gay and he writes about his upbringing in the shadow of Raven's Craig and, you know, just you know, about all that. So it's a, it's a different, but it was, it was similar, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So we had that kind of brotherhood immediately yeah. and familiarity. We just had a great talk and it seemed very natural. So they obviously thought I was like a TV natural. Um, and they come up to me, the producers were like running after the show. Oh, that was fantastic. You know, you want, you want to do a, a series or something? You want to do a show or something? I know. You know what I mean? Everything starts with a conversation, <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, I never bother. So we set up a Zoom and they were like, right, what are you interested in? I said, well, I'm writing this book about Rave, you know, and I, I was a big raver right back in the day. I'm right into all that. And they said, oh, that sounds amazing. Have a couple of weeks, see what you can do. And I went up the road, right? And I was like, I'm just going to do a treatment, right? I've seen one of these, I can do this. And I did a full treatment, right? I called it, Scott. I can't remember what I called it. I think I called it Rave Scotland. And uh, I just put, stole loads of pictures off the internet and stuck them in and just, just jazzed up yeah. a wee bit and then sent it and said, aye, that's what I would do. And then that was it, mate. They just they were like, amazing. Let's do it. Was that a journey back to your youth as well? <laughs> oh, big time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, getting the interview, Miller Kalyi, right, who was a big superstar, I mean, you know what I mean? Scott Brown, George Bowie. It's like legendary yeah. stuff, right? I was nervous about that. They were actually quite nervous, some of them, actually. Surprisingly, because no. they're normally in a dark room, half cut, everybody in front of them's out, I'm not. Right, here we are, but putting cameras in their face, and they're a bit like, ah, oh, what did I say? Right. But no, that was amazing. But I, I really did shoehorn in the PC DJ stuff. They're like, well, no, I'm not sure about this. I'm like, no, we're doing the PC DJ stuff. Hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that needs to happen. Come on. Right, so we just, and, let me tell you, right, see if you have a production point, right, they're hard to deal with people for a bit because they're just mental, right, <laughs> DJ Blitz must have phoned one of the production coordinators, I mean, about 50 times, he was on the phone all the time, right, <laughs> sending our tunes and all that, right, <laughs> that's just because we're just a bit mad, <laughs> you know what I mean, she, she said she banged into Davide, <laughs> so she did, and he was like talking away and all that, and she's with her family, like a fucking <laughs> mental, they're just, but do you know what that is? It's a generosity spirit. Yeah. Right? They're creatives. Right? They were creatives long before I was a creative. Right? You had Gav B's, your Zikis, Rank, you know that. They created a subculture out of nothing. Well, I mean, they stole everything they made, right? <laughs> apart from that. Right? Apart from the, the theft element and the copyright. Right? They just done it for nothing, man. They just, they done it for passion, prestige. Just for pleasure, mm-hmm. right? And we came from a place where people didn't have any money to spend on, you know, on, you know, intellectual yeah. property, music, right? I don't know. The PC DJ thing is, un- it's a gold mine, it's untapped. Yeah. So I just, I, I had seen the BBC social thing, and this is years later, right? They only did, I don't know, a five minute interview or something, my sister showed me, and I swear, I just, honestly, I was filled with pure pride with pure like, I was part of that man it's just as a fan I was Aye. I loved that so I was that was it I'm, I'm, I'm doing it man and I, I think that was the best bit actually Aye. you know it just I was a more natural man and I actually the two of them were filmed quite far away so I had put a lot of weight on during lockdown so I'm actually <laughs> if you watch it closer I'm quite fat <laughs> and at the end I'm looking no bad <laughs> so man so oh, nah, it was good mate really good love fun. that and good how's fun. the setting book Fucking hell. <laughs> so second book's Raveheart? Second book's Raveheart, aye. And I honestly, to, this was conceived in 2015, right? When Young Team wasn't published and I was, I was in the anywhere, mm-hmm. right? And I've just, I had finished the Young Team, right? I had I'd written all I could write, right? It was massive. It was like 230,000 words. It was just, nothing was happening. 
see these 300 directions, right? I heard somebody say it and I was like, there's not 300 publishers. And I'm like, I know, but there is 300 agents. There are 300 emails online because believe me, I found them all, <laughs> right? And I used, you know, I just used to bombard them, genuinely. If it was 10 agents or five agents in an agency, I would email all of them, right? I would email the inbox, the submissions one. And some of them were like, it's still an all. Stop <laughs> applying. You, you don't belong here. <laughs> I'll see you next year. Right? I'll see you, in, you know, I just had to, so it was 50 to 70 applications mm -hmm. and I'd wait six months and I'd do it again. And I'd read, I'd read like the letter and it was very like formal, you know, that way young people do like, dear sir or madam, <laughs> here is my book. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And it's, it's not like that, mm -hmm. you know, but um, I man. What can you tell us about it? Rave up? Yep. So I had this, so as I say, right, I've reached this point, total creative, <laughs> Just nothing, stuck in the mud, nothing's moving. And I was like, I need to do an odd book, right? Or I'm going to go nuts. So I'm like, who played the DJ in the, who played the tunes in the time capsule, right? I was like, I was getting nostalgic, man. <laughs> I was thinking about ice skating. <laughs> I was, I was thinking about ice skating and we, you know, <laughs> honestly, for the, the few talents of people near Drinko Bridge, ice skating is one of them, right? <laughs> we can all ice skate. Same in East Coast Bride, right? I think Clyde Banks still on the money. And I was decent, by the way. I had mm -hmm. hockey skates. I can still skate, right? I can still <laughs> skate. And I just had such good fun there. Do you know that? It was actually a great laugh. We had that nice disco, so it was like dance tunes, right? Everybody fleeing about. All the birds. We used to wear a mare peak down and all that. It was brilliant, right? That's before the streets, so maybe 12, 13. Right. And I was like, who has it played the tunes? Because I did remember there was like a DJ booth and a platform, right? And it was like green and, sorry, uh, pink and blue neon. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ah, I'm writing a story about that guy. Because he must have been some kind of like, it was probably just one of the PTs with the gym or something. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It was, I was like, that's the story, right? That's the guy. What's his name? DJ Turbo, right? That was it. And I just, it grew from there. It started to mushroom into this mad thing, right? And I was, I was thinking about the criminal justice, uh, you know, the, the rave ban, succession of repetitive beats and all that. And I'm like, what if rave actually got banned? Like, mm. what if they managed it? Right? I'm like, Scotland wouldn't have that, right? It would erupt in rave paramilitary violence. <laughs> and I'm like, that's the story, man. That's the story. It's this guy, he's a, he's a hero, right? And then I started to think about forum, right? And I'm like, I don't want this to be like, not boring, man, not a young team, but like traditional. You know, I want this to be fun and fast. And the best way to do that, right, is like, it was like a play or a script, because mm -hmm. it's not like all the literary, cluttery paragraphs. It's just like, there's the name, there's what they say, next one. So I wrote it as a play. Right. But a, a hybrid play novel. <laughs> 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 it's going to be a fucking disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a fucking disaster. All the critics will be sharpening their knives already. They'll fucking maul me for doing that. They will. But fuck it. So it's fun. You've it's got to find thing. the guy that actually was the DJ. I know, I know, I know. But well, do you know what? See, when I was doing Scotland on the rave, right? This old boy, right? He came up to me and all that. Aye, been in here since 91, son, since it opened. <laughs> no, like the Johnny. <laughs> He's like the Johnny, right? And he told me a story, right? And I was like, what happened to the big uh, Willie Mammoth? <laughs> He was like, I brought him in 91, son. I carried him out. <laughs> right? <laughs> And, he's, and he told me that story, right? This is 100% true, right? He's like, do you know what? It broke my heart, right? And I'm like, I know what? Listen, I was quite sad not to see it here. The, the caveman and all that, and the yeah. T-Rex, right? With the red eyes. So I've written them on the story, obviously, right? But what was I going to say? He was like, I cut his foot off, right? I cut his big paw off. His hoof, I think he said, right? <laughs> And I've got it at the bottom of my garden, right? I've got soil in it. <laughs> and my missus is growing the flowers at it. And I'm like, RIP, man. Honestly, that's beautiful. Honestly. So I've, read, I've wrote that into the story. Mate, so I, I, hope, I hope it was actually him that was a DJ. Right, I think it might be. That'd be incredible. <laughs> so I, it's coming. We're at line edit stage, so it's literally the, the fine tuning. But I, 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 yeah. honestly, it's there. It's 500 pages long. It's massive. It's just, it'll be seen who is actually mad enough to publish it. <laughs> That's the truth, because it is bonkers. See, on, is the, see on the publishing side, you spoke about it a wee bit there. How much do the rejections get to you, or do they know? The young team. Both. Oh, mate, you know what? <laughs> my uh, tutor in uni the other day went, I, somehow I don't think you're going to get 300 rejections this time. And I'm like, I hope no. You know what I mean? But 300 rejections does crush a man, yeah. right? And it was just no, no, no. And I put them all into a wee essay about Scots language, and most of them were because it was written in Scots, by the way, honestly. An English audience won't connect with us, right? We worry about readership, we worry about da, da, da. And I was like, 
thought, you know, and that was way before I was aging to the red and right. My first nod, right, the green light where I thought this might actually happen. I mean, I always believed, right, see when they said it's still an all this year, I was like, see you next year, you can't, right? <laughs> but it was like that, you know what I mean? I just, I didn't give a fuck. They, I broke every rule, honestly. I broke every rule. See all these writing advice forum things? Only sent to one agent at a time. Give them three months, you know? Give them, they're busy. Fuck off. <laughs> Do you know how long that would I take? To do 300? About 30 years or something? Do you know what I mean? So Aye. I was like, no. Right, I know you're busy, but so read. Aye. It's good though. Right. Anyway, but loads of loads of rejection, right? And then I got published in Gutter mm-hmm. magazine. It's a literary anthology for Glasgow, right? That was the green light, and I was like, it's gonna happen. Aye. Right. But then another six months go by, right? And then um Jonathan Rupin at the time was my first agent, right? And he had just started up, right? I was his first client. Um, and he said, I'm not sure, right? I'm not sure. I like the flavour of it, right? But see what you can do, right? I'm worried it's too long, mm-hmm. right? Because I'd sent him the whole book and it was long, right? So I just phoned in work and I was like, I've got a Jason fix, now can I come in? <laughs> right? And I just worked, I mean, 24 hours a day. I barely slept, right? I just went for it. I cut 50,000 words out of the manuscript, right? And I went back to him. And he was, and he signed me immediately. Right, he just he seen it. He could just see the energy. He knew I would do anything, mm-hmm. and that I would graft. Right, so I signed me, and that was it. Six months later, he's like, "Congratulations, it's Picador." So, I man, I was living down in London at the time. Man, I'd moved in there, and I was living in a fuck, and I, and I do mean a, a rat infested shithole, <laughs> right? And you know, just I was living that like artist life, you know, yeah. when you open your cornflakes and it's full of fucking mouse shit. I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? I was selling cars. I worked six days a week as a car salesman. That's what I did for years and years. Selling cars, writing 24 hours a day. So see, when I'm editing Rave Heart now, I'm like, just remember the privilege, right? Of actually being a student, right? And having time to think and go back and do it. Because that's what a lot of people. There's not a lot of working class writers out there, right? A lot of them are from means, so see if they fuck up, they're all right. See if I fucked up, I've got nothing, right? So I'm trying to ed- edit mm-hmm. it calmly this time, where I, was, mm-hmm. where I was coming home for a 12 hour day getting called a fucking arsehole because I hadn't sold a motor to then edit it all night. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So the editing of the young team was a wee bit roleplay something. Mm-hmm. Surely there's a diary of a car salesman in there. Oh, uh, I'm going to try and write a novel about it, man. I did. St- mm-hmm. I, I, honestly, I think after I did Rave Heart, because I'm doing the memoir, right? The, the real story for PhD. After that, I think the car sales book will happen. Mm-hmm. I kind of sketched it out, man, what, what, what it might look like, but I just, I kind of get a title for it, man. I'm, well, I have got one, but I'm keeping it up my sleeve. Well, there's a challenge for everybody here. Get you your know, title. But I think, honestly, it's such a weak kind of microcosm of society, you know what I mean? You've got, and it is a hierarchy, obviously, you know, it's a traditional hierarchy. So right for the dealer principle, he's like the Don, right? And then the capos are like business manager, <laughs> finance manager, sales manager. Right. Buying a car can be a beautiful, I think it's a nice experience if you get a good sales team, but see if it's not, it's a fucking nightmare. And, and people hate car salesmen. Aye. I mean, they actually fucking hate you. <laughs> like, seriously, right? We are running a bit fucking mad, right? In a tracksuit and all that, right? And people were nicer to me then than when I was wearing an Arnold Clark tie. <laughs> I'd go to Tesco some nights and I would see people fucking growling at me, man. I'd like, he's like, fucking done me about five years ago in a Toyota prick. And I'm like, not me, it's somebody. You're the face of the pricks. No, Aye. I mean, fucking hell. You're up there with traffic wardens. Honestly, people actually are physically, they hate you. They can't hate you. Oh, it's, it's brutal, man. But also, it is a source of a lot of amusement. Do you know what I mean? It's just such a, it's, see when you get it, it's good, honestly. What other job can a guy with no qualifications earn fucking five hundred pound a day? Mm-hmm. Right? Selling drugs. Mm-hmm. Apparently. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you know what I mean? It's just like you don't need any prior qualifications. Right. You're straight in there and just you need to just suffer. It's a suffer fest. You know? Fuck's sake, you fucking you're eating a fucking free course meal, you've literally sat down and took one bite of sandwich and like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Fucking demoralised fucking you know, <laughs> Fuck's sake, you fucking, know what I mean, take an hour for your lunch and all that, you pick. You've been in there about five minutes. That's what it's like. It's fucking hardcore. And it just, it put years on me. So, and I was chasing the dream, do you know what I mean? I don't ever say I didn't work, right? I worked, Aye. fucking worked. Right? I worked hard. And my pals are out fucking shifting gear and all that, and I was selling Toyotas. So, <laughs> there is some kind of honourable 
You know, I said that that Scottish. I was speaking at the Scot a Scottish government event earlier on this year, and I was like, I would say honest employment, but it was car sales, so let's not over it. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, honestly, before I finish the first half, do you know something? I just want to say thank you to Betty, man. Nah, I know, honestly. Man. Honestly, wherever she is, right, if her family are still there, I really, honestly, it was, it was a life-changing, just a wee pinnacle. Sliding doors, right, that's become a real cliche, isn't it? People say, oh, sliding doors moments. Life's full of them, by the way. You get an opportunity sometimes to reach out to somebody or to make a difference for somebody, right? If you ever get an opportunity like that, I mean it, take it, right? I spoke about this before, right? I was doing it at a training, right? I just... Car salesmen change job all the time, right? Because that's what they do. They just revolve endlessly, right? So I was doing a training in Nottingham, right? And I was like, fuck's sake, I need to get away down there. And I'm sitting, right? And this boy comes in late, right? And I was like, and he's fucking to be fucking Fife or something. He's got a big Scottish accent. I was like, oh, fuck's sake, of course I was. <laughs> right? And I was like, you're a dumpling. And he was sat down and he was laughing, right? But do you know what? I was looking at the boy and he looked really, really fucking stressed out. So he did. They didn't look well, right? And see, at lunch, I was like, are you all right? Like, you, you fucking all right? And he was like, mm, you can see young guys, right? And I just, I forced it to him and he's like, mm, I've been a bit suicidal, mate, trying to kill myself and that. And honestly, I just had this pure feeling that this boy was going to fucking hurt himself. I just had the feeling, right? And I, I hope if he ever sees us, he doesn't mind me. I'll not, I'll not mention a name or anything like that, but, you know, I just, I just had the feeling that he was really struggling, right? And I said to him, I'm going to send you something, I want your address, right? And Young Team Proofs had just arrived, so I only got 10, I sent him one, right? I didn't hear from him for ages, right? But see, after, he messaged me and he was like, mate, honestly, that changed my life reading that, honestly. And he's, as far as I know, he's, he's doing well, he's got a family, he's smashing the car sales, and he's just... I'm not saying that was me, but you just have that opportunity sometimes to be that butterfly's wings or the sliding doors. You just reach out. Yeah. If you see somebody struggling, just reach out. You can change a life. You can save one. Yeah. She saved mine. Loads of people did. Yeah. Loads of people. They didn't give up on me. They seen beneath the performance. Guys got a hard time out there, by the way. People think men are these Spartan warriors or these fucking evil bastards and we're all, do you know what I mean? Like, we got a really, really bad time in the media these days. A lot of young people are struggling, guys, or young men. They don't know where to turn. I could tell you the names of how many have sort of committed suicide. Right, I wish I was there to just fucking put my arms around them and say, don't go, just stay. You don't get the opportunity to get the phone call in the morning to tell yeah. them you're away. Fuck. Even as late as even as late as lockdown, right? That happened to us. Right, one of our pals killed himself. You know, I'm not saying we could have done anything, right? When you're already on that road, sometimes there's no way back, right? But you'd take the opportunity, wouldn't you? Of course you would. Of course you would. Anyway, so aye, thank you, Betty. Thanks, guys. Honestly. And a round of applause for this man for the first part of the show.